So it's with great pleasure now that I ask Kevin to give his lecture on working class life in Hunslet, 1900 to 1939. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, I think yes. you, you, you can see my screen share then, Alan. Yeah. Yes, we're all fine to go. Right, okay, right, thank you. Yeah. Right, working class life in Hunslet, 1900 to 1939. Um, it's a pleasure to be lecturing to the Thorsby Society again. For those of you that um, are used to my lunchtime lectures, uh, Thorsby Society lectures are rather different in the sense that this is a work in progress. It's more of a conversational sort of lecture. And I do hope that um, at the end of my talk that we will have some time for uh, question and discussions. Um, Stephen Burt and I have been writing books together for, I'm just going to make a little adjustment here, I think. Yeah, that's better. I'm just, I've just adjusted it so I can only see me and the, um, the slide. Yeah, Stephen and I have been writing books together for, since the mid uh, 1980s. Now you will appreciate that uh, on in the bottom left-hand corner, that's me on the left, you know, the good-looking one, but uh, I thought I should show Stephen because Stephen has a lot to do with this lecture. Um, for at least 10 years, maybe 20 years, we've decided that we would like to produce a companion volume to our illustrated history of Leeds, which we produced in 1994. Um, more recently, in the last five years, Stephen in particular has got a lot of work done in gathering information for that book, excepting that at the moment, the book that will be produced is purely a history of Hunslet. Um, Stephen, in the process of doing that work, has scoured every possible source of pictures of Hunslet. He scanned 200 years of newspapers to gather information. He's investigated every source we can think of, archival source for that information. And the result is that he has produced a 250 page draft of a book on Hunslet. So it'd be a large book equivalent in size to the illustrated history. Um, I've been rather late coming to the party because I've been preoccupied with certain things and um, Stephen retired four years earlier than I did. Um, so my role in the book on Hunslet is that of, in effect, an editor in chief, a, cri a critic, a suggester of ideas. And also I've uh, done little bits of research and will be providing some short sections that will go in the book. But Stephen is very much the main man on this. Um, I'm currently working on the 20th century chapters, looking at them. And because of this sort of rather short notice for this lecture, I thought, what could I talk about? And I thought it should fit in with the work that I'm currently doing and have been doing in the last couple of months on Hunslet in the 20th century. So when the Thorsby Society asked me what I might lecture about, I thought, well, OK, let's do working class life in Hunslet in the 40 years before the Second World War. So the lecture is a work in progress. It's not a polished lecture in any sense. Um, it will tell you some of the things I know about Hunslet in this per period, but at the same time, it will also expose things that I don't know and things that I would like to know about. Um, ideally, I'd like to sort of road test this talk on the people of Hunslet, people in the, the Hunslet community today, just to see what they think so that they can make comments, uh, correct things that I've got wrong, and generally uh, help inform us about what is a period which is in part of it at least within the memories of people living today or their parents. Well, I don't have a great deal of time. The lecture will only focus on certain aspects of working class life. Um, 
It won't deal with domestic life in particular. It won't deal with shops or shopping. It won't really deal with religion. But in particular, it will focus on working class life and poverty. That's working life and poverty and education. And as I say, I hope there'll be time for questions at the end. Fortunately, I think Stephen is listening to the lecture. And when we come to question time, no doubt he will be answer, able to answer for us maybe some of the tricky questions. Well, as far as Hunslet is concerned, one of the issues is uh, a lot of people aren't really very familiar with Hunslet. So we have to have some orientation here. Now, here is uh, an aerial view of Hunslet as it is today on Google Maps. And key features you need to note are that here we have Hunslet Road running across, diagonally across the image. Coming off Hunslet Road, we have Church Street, which runs down to Penny Hill, where the present day shopping centre. But Church Street is the core of the what was the medieval village and later the centre of the township of Hunslet. Um, here we see the M1 motorway running through. But going across the moor are the remnant of across the remnants of Hunslet Moor, parts of which still exist today. But on the western boundary of Hunslet, more or less coming down from the city centre, we have Hunslet Road, which is you know the later addition to sorry, we have Dewsbury Road, which is a later addition to Hunslet. So we have the historic core here. We have uh, the moor. Hunslet car down here where the Middleton Railway is, Woodhouse Hill there. And finally, going across to the other side of Dewsbury Road, we have Hunslet Hall Road and the site of the former uh, Hunslet Manor House. A reasonably present day view looking up from the south through Hunslet. This is Church Street running up with the Parish Church, well, there's just the tower there now, but running up the hill on the left, we have the Penny Hill Centre. And here is the Penny Hill Centre. Some of you will have been, been there. It's a shopping centre. This is where the core of Hunslet Village was. And if we went through there, you get to the, uh, uh, the Morrison's big car park and supermarket. But coming further up, uh, Penny Hill or Church Street, we get through to the entrance into what was once Waterloo Road. And you can just see uh, Hunslet Library is there. And just beyond there, the Garden Gate Pub. So part of this lecture concentrates on the Hunslet economy. Now, what were the major industries in Hunslet in 1900 at the start of our period? Well, here we have, here we have uh, the railway industry, the manufacture of locomotives and engineering was hugely important as the cornerstone of Hunslet industry. Um, in the period from 19, uh, 1900 to 1918, Hunslet industry effectively boomed, although the boom during the war uh, concealed a long time de term decline in the industry. Um, here we see uh, the Hunslet Engine Company, one of the most famous manufacturers of steam engines. And the important thing to note is that between 1900 and 1918, 80% of its output was exported to the world and to the empire. Another of the great firms of Hunslet in this period, which was John Fowler's Steam Plough Works and on the current day Costco site. But again, this industry was heavily export orientated. Hunslet was famous in this period also for the manufacture of traction engines. Here we see McLaren's um, traction engine advert. Um, these were powerful, wonderful vehicles. And a bit further down the road towards uh, Pepper Road, you had Mann's engineering who made steam powered 
road vehicles, that is, uh, wagons, in effect, the lorries of the day. Hunslet was also noted for the manufacture of steel. And here we see Leeds Steelworks, which was actually in Hunslet. And you notice that in these pictures, you see all the pollution in the atmosphere here, but the arrows are pointing to where Hunslet town or village was. And it's important to note that this was happening, this activity on such a large scale, I think there's 20 acres of it, was actually happening within 300 yards of Hunslet National School and Church Street. So it was very, very close. In addition to engineering, of course, in Hunslet, amongst other things, it also had a textile industry. And here we have an advert for uh, Dodgson and Hargreaves Limited, makers of blankets and you recognize some of you you can see in the bottom right of this picture the air and cold navigation running past Hunslet Mill which we know today and is currently being renovated. Hunslet was also famous for printing in the Edwardian period and here we have uh, Alf Cook's print works. Uh, Alf Cook's was there uh, the uh, E.J. Arnold printers was also in Hunslet, so it had a lot of industries. But the thing to remember is that the period immediately before the First World War, there were all, all, already problems, although perhaps hidden, um, in Hunslet in this period, and this was due to what was happening in the world economy. Now here you've got a rather complicated uh, chart. It's economic historians at work, which I am in essence, just showing what was happening in the period up to 1913. You can see here that in that period, the growth in the economy was about one to two percent. So not fast, but okay-ish. And in fact, over that period, the total output of industrial output of the British economy grew by some 30 percent. As far as unemployment in this period was concerned, now these are national figures, you're looking at an employment rate of about unemployment rate of about 4%. It did jump up in odd years, 1908, 1909, 8.5%. And there was periodic uh, problem strikes. Now, the significant thing in this period is that you can see that as far as the UK was concerned, 51% of UK exports were textiles, 33% was pr producer goods, that's machinery primary, 10% um, coal, but these were the old staple industries. And the thing to remember is that Hunslet, its industry was primarily concentrated on these older industries. Um, iron and steel output went up by 25% in this period, but Britain was being overtaken uh, by the America and Germany due to, to its slowness to adapt. In engineering, you see that in 1907, half of the output of British engineering was being exported. So effectively, um, the British economy, and it applied to Hunstead, was suffering in a sense from uh, potential foreign competition. Moving into the 1920s, the picture was very different. The optimism of the Edwardian period, in, in a sense, was replaced by the age of mass unemployment. In the 1920s, we see that while output of industry and building went up by 17%, actually the average rate of unemployment was nine to 10%. This was a big jump the general strike we see in the Leeds engineering uh, industry in between 1921 and 1926, the Leeds engineering industry's employment fell from 36,000 to 15,000. Going into the 1930s, the position was even worse. Whilst output grew across the economy, the average rate of unemployment in the early 1930s was 20%. So we have the Great Depression. And uh, 
some a very difficult period. Now, a lot of this would have affected what was happening in Hunslet. Um, but there was growth and growth that affected the Leeds economy, um, mass production, tailoring, printing presses, food processing, gas holders and reservoirs, etc. So there were areas growing across the economy and of course, particularly the service industries. Well, so Hunslet's staple industries were badly hit, but there were signs of growth, there was adaptation. So we have brains, uh, steel pressings on Hunslet Road, which did very well in this period. The printing industry did very well. And then Hunslet was a specialist in producing large storage containers, whether they were gasometers or oil tanks. Hunslet also had a famous sardine canning factory. And of course, it had chemicals in which there was some expansion. Well, we now come to Hunslet in the period 1908 to 1925 and Francis Anderson. I've used for this lecture, and Stephen and I have been looking at these in considerable detail, personal reminiscences of life in Hunslet in the period leading up to the Second World War. Um, almost 20 years ago, a man called, I have to look up his name again, but basically a chap from Halifax sent me a manuscript for this man, Francis Anderson, um, 48,000 words, which was a reminiscences of his life in Hunslet as a boy. There was no chronology in the uh, typescript. You see, he was born in 1900. He came to live in Hunslet in 1908. And his reminiscences focus on his childhood from 1908 to 1913, although there were some references to the 1920s. When I say there was no chronology to this, there was no them thematic order to it. And basically what the manuscript consists of is a lot of two page reminiscences. He was a lively and optimistic person who clearly enjoyed life. Now, in order to make this useful to writing the history of Hunter, as you can see, I've had to sift through looking for particular themes. Oh yes, and now having done this work, I realize I couldn't make head and tail of this 20 years ago because I didn't understand the nature of Hunslet. And so I would like to contact Peter Summerscales, who sent this to me a long time ago. He hoped maybe it could be published. And I would like to contact the Anderson family who may still be somewhere in Hunslet, I don't know, because I do think this is a manuscript with a, with a considerable amount of editing could be very, very useful. So a little bit of orientation here. Where did Frank Anderson, Francis Anderson live? And the answer is that his early reminiscences are about life in the Albert Yard, which was just off um, Church Street in Hunslet. If we move on to the next slide, and just to say here, orientation again, there is a low lane coming down from Hunslet Lane, low road. There is Church Street running down there. Waterloo Road runs up to join Hunslet Road. And then in particular, we have Jack Lane running along here. Now, so Francis Anderson was living with his family in the Albert Yard. I don't have a photograph of him. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the Albert Yard. But looking here, this picture, a civic trust photograph, is looking down towards Hunslet Parish Church. And the Albert Yard, you can see with the arrow, was behind this row of blind back houses. Um, obviously, a great deal of demolition going on at this point. But I want to point out to you before we move on to this, there is the church and this huge building, which for some time I thought, what on earth is it? But it is Hunslet National School, an elementary school. So moving on to uh, this is the 1891 Ordnance Survey Plan, which was the best thing I could find at that point. And here we see on here, 
the Albert Yard, this yard, this is Penny Hill area, Church Street, and there is the Albert Yard in which Francis lived. And I wanted you to notice here, outlined in the red square is the Hunslet Ragged Sunday School, which comes into the story. And then just south here, we have Hunslet um, St. Mary's Parish Church. So what was Hunslet like at this point? Well, this 1929 view gives us a very good impression, much the, as Francis Anderson would have found it in uh, 1908 when he came to Hunslet. We're at the top of Church Street here as it merges with the junction with uh, Low Road. We see the Wellington Hotel at the top. But the point about this picture, which I think is very intriguing, is that really, when you look at this scene, this almost looks like a semi-rural setting or the character, the buildings have the character of really a rural market town rather than the heart of a great industrial centre. We have to remember, of course, that Church Street was the medieval street or the this main street of the medieval uh, village of Hunslet. And therefore, it, even in this period, contained buildings and houses and cottages that dated back to the 17th century, even the 16th century, which partly accounts for its character. Well, life at Hunslet National School, we see the parish church there, but in this view, we see this three-story enormous school, an elementary school that was built next to the parish church. It was opened in 1895. Remarkably, this housed 1,000 pupils and took them from the age from 5 to 13, which was then in Francis's time was the school leaving age. Now, in his reminiscences, he clearly enjoyed his time there. He used to go from there up to uh, Hunslet Moor School to do woodwork. He recalled a host of things, football matches on Hunslet Moor with other elementary schools, Hunslet Carr School, Jack Lane School, St. Joseph's Roman Catholic School, and he talks about, he's very fond in his reminiscences of relating songs of the time and the things people chanted, and he talks about the sort of songs that Victoria School football teams chanted or shouted as they, or sang as they came back across the moor to their schools. One of the things that Francis did when he was at the National School was to go up uh, Gordon Road from the school on Monday mornings to go swimming at Hunslet Swimming Baths where he had lessons and on the way back he would nip in through the window of his blind back house as they passed it, get a bread cake and then continue back to school. He wonderfully evokes how kids entertain themselves in the yards and streets of Hunslet before the First World War. The songs they sang, the games they played, he describes about 20 of them. He describes concerts that he went to at the Ragged Sunday School. He recalls the errands that he ran from the Albert Yard, who was a coal dealer, so he used to take coal around in a handcart as a delivery for, the, uh, for Mrs. Todd, who lived in the yard. He would take Mr. Todd's supper down to the Crown Bottle Works, just on Jack Lane, where three of his uncles worked. Uh, he uh, enjoyed Friday nights, in the Stillhouse Market or Stillus Market, which was on Woodhouse Street, he enjoyed going to the cinema uh, at the picture drone, picture drone, which was Hunslet's first cinema in 1911. But of course, a big issue was poverty. Francis's family was really quite poor. His father and his three brothers living in 
Uh, the yard were coal miners. Uh, it was a tough industrial environment to work in, cramped, dangerous conditions, physically exhausting. There was no guarantee of work every day. And indeed, there was quite a lot of strife in the industry with strikes in 1912 and 1921. He noted that there was plenty of slack time in the pits for his barber and brothers. And in 1912, perhaps I think when the strike was on, he and other poor kids had free meals provided for them. Uh, they took breakfast at Hunslet National School where they had jam on brown bread and cocoa. And then they went up for hot dinners at the ragged school on uh, Gordon Road where they got shepherd's pie and rice pudding and things like that. So rather reminiscent of the current situation today with the issue over school dinners for poor and destitute children. The 1921 miners' strike highlights the financial position of a lot of workers in Hunslet in the Edwardian period. Namely, um, we see that coal miners and skilled workers, especially in engineering, could put money aside for a rainy day. However, if you were a labourer without security of work, poverty and destitution was a constant threat. The coal strike, of which I want to give a brief account, provides a good insight into the effects of industrial strife in Hunslet in the 1920s. This is in 1921. The government had taken control of the mines during the First World War, and miners wanted the coal industry nationalized after the war. Immediately after the First World War, there was a great coal shortage in Europe. And in 1920, the industry was still riding a high wave of prosperity and selling exports at unprecedented prices. But in 1921, there was a sharp slump in coal prices, particularly for export. And at that point, the government decided to give the mines back to the owners. The owners were then faced with large losses at the existing level of wages and at coal prices, and therefore they demanded drastic wage cuts, which they knew the miners wouldn't accept, and therefore they locked them out. On the 31st of March, they were locked out. The end result of all this was the miners suffered a crushing defeat and returned to work on the owners' terms in June 1921 when their funds were exhausted. So how this played out is in Hunslet is described in an article in the Leeds Mercury, which was written during the strike. The Yorkshire Post published a highly revealing interview with the Reverend Gallagher, the vicar of Hunslet, which was headlined, The Problem of Subsistence, How Miners and Others Carry On. Readers were informed that Hunslet had been very badly hit by the coal strike and that the great industrial district had never experienced such a difficult time. Thousands of miners, it said, live in Hunslet. The reporter noted that they had been idle for seven weeks. Worse still, the coal stoppage had thrown many thousands of other workers out of work, including men employed at the steelworks and at the other great engineering establishments. Hunslet, the great workshop of the world, is well nigh idle, said the reporter. The vicar who he interviewed said he was amazed how the working classes of Hunslet were coping. As far as he could see, there was no general acute distress, though there were many individual cases of hardship which were being relieved. The reporter asked, well, how do you account for this? The vicar thought that it was because the miners had been pretty well prepared for the stoppage. He said they had earned good wages and had been fairly provident. He thought the miners in the district were of a high class type. A few might be thriftless, but 99 out of 100 had been provident. They had not by any means spent their earnings, all their earnings, during the last couple of years of prosperity. 
generally, he said, the average working man is now much more provident than he was some years ago, or his wife is. A great money had uh, money in the cooperative society, which he said served as a poor man's bank during the present stoppage. There were also, of course, the school savings banks, and from those, a good deal of money had been withdrawn, but that money and those savings had not been exhausted. He pointed out that the allotment movement had proved a source both of savings and profit to many working men, and the miners with allotments were among the most provident of them all. He also noted and pointed out that for affected workers who were not miners, the unemployment dole had broken the back of the distress. It had prevented distress becoming acute so soon. He said that in many families, two or three persons were drawing unemployment pay amounting to two or three pounds a week. I think that's between them. And this had been enough to keep the whole family going. He never could remember a time when a whole community had been practically out of work for seven weeks with so little apparent collapse. Of course, there were soup kitchens, teas provided for children, and a public relief fund. The other effects of the strike were mass unemployment in Leeds. It was noted in another part of the paper that during the strike, there were 75,000 people out of work in Leeds or working two to three days a week. This included 55,000 people on the registers of the employment exchange, which did not include the miners on strike or a large number of persons who were not entitled to uh, benefit under the Unemployment Insurance Act of 1920. Well, that gives a bit of detailed background to life in Hunslet and what workers uh, faced and how some had resources and some didn't. Oh yes, and here we have, sorry, this is a soup kitchen, um, not, not actually in Hunslet, but showing this, and it's 1926, but these are miners uh, at their soup kitchen, bread and soup uh, during the, the great general strike. But moving on, there were lots of pawnbrokers in Hunslet. Um, people said they ate and drank like kings at the weekend, but very soon after the wages were running out, they were at the pawnbrokers. Seemingly, this is the pawnbroker shop on Branch Church Street in 1904. And you can see, you could actually, believe it or not, pawn your socks. Well, I have no time to describe the domestic routine of the Hunslet housewife, the cooking on the range, the washing wash days and hanging washing across the line, how they kept their houses clean, you know, the trips to the corner shops, the household diet, the street hawkers, which went through the streets, the street singers, all things which Francis Anderson explains. He enjoyed writing about and talking about what was happening, you know, street life in Hunslet. And he notes that people were marching and processing, processing a lot in this period. In his childhood, he remembers lots of groups marching. The Salvation Army with its band processed. The boys' brigades from the chapel with their bands processed. The St. Joseph's church Catholics processed through the streets. Men from pubs, perhaps when they had a bit too much to drink, processed around singing. It was a very colourful life. Francis left school on his 13th birthday in October 1913. A grand school, he said, so he'd enjoyed life at the National School, and his first job was an errand boy at a clothing factory. But then he got fed up with that. So in 1914, he got a job on Dewsbury Road, as we see here, um, as a lather boy at a barber's. Now, introducing Hunslet Lane gives us a chance, sorry, Dewsbury Road gives us a chance to look at West Hunslet, um, and here we see Hunslet Road. And one of the first things that she strikes you about this view, um, which is about uh, 
I think it's about 1909, this view. Basically, we're looking north on uh, Dewsbury Road with St. Peter's Church with its uh, tower and spire on the right hand side. And the thing that immediately impresses you here is that this is a well appointed street, uh, good quality shops, uh, good looking buildings. It's a huge contrast with Hunslet Church Street. And this emphasizes the point that Dewsbury Road was a creation of the 19th century. A lot of its buildings were built from the 1850s onwards. So you've got the contrast between the very shabby looking uh, Church Street in Hunslet with this quite impressive street for the time. Um, some of the buildings there we see um, the Hunslet Library and Police Station, which had been opened in 1903, Scrutons, fruiterers and dealers in sweets. You think looking maybe for a perhaps a higher quality of clientele and then the Methodist New Connection Chapel. Close by on Meadow Road, literally within the medieval Hunslet Township boundary was the Queen's Theatre. Francis went there from time to time, particularly when he was more grown up. And it reminds me that he was almost obsessed with music. And in his account, remembering these are days before radio existed, he talks about the popular songs of the day, the musicians amongst the back-to-back -back streets of Hunslet, the singers amidst them. And it's a, an example of the sort of life that people led. Now, jumping on uh, just around the corner from uh, Dewsbury Road, uh, not far from the library on Disraeli Street, here's some wonderful pictures with uh, a chap called Peter Rice brought to me. His wife's grandfather ran this um, firm, which hired out carriages and wagonettes in the, exor in the uh, Georgian period. You, sorry, in the Edwardian period, you see here that it's a rather sort of peaky blinders sort of look, isn't it, around 1914. They could take you anywhere so that this is um, George Horsfall, his firm, and basically they could take you top left in a horse-drawn charavan on your day out, or for your last day out, they could take you in their hearses. So they were undertakers, funeral directors as well. Well, Francis moved about quite a lot. And here we see an aerial view. One of the things to say about Hunslet when you look at the plans is that Hunslet was full. It was absolutely packed with streets of houses and factories. And here we see some of them here. There we have, this is Hunslet Road running down the bottom. Then we go up Goodman Street. Uh, South Accommodation Road to the river, Hunslet Mill at the top right there. And then we see St. Helen's Mills here. But if you go along the road, just at the very end, we just see the end of Newport Street, which will, as you'll see, will be significant in a moment. Francis and his family moved. They moved five times in 10 years, but they eventually moved to Buxton Yard, there's St. Helen's Mill. So we're just at the southern edge of that photograph that you've just seen. And they lived in Buxton's Yard. And in it, there was St. Silas's Mission Room. Well, Francis talks in detail about life in this yard, the kids, the characters. And also, I mean, hunts that possess lots of these mission halls, bringing religion and re recreation to people in darkest Hunslet, and he, re he remembers in particular the operettas that were put on for local entertainment at St. Silas's mission. I don't have time to tell you about the disappearing vicar of Hunslet. Francis mentions him briefly, but essentially he disappeared in 1913. It was rumoured that he jumped off or fallen off the cliff at Flamborough Head, but effectively he'd got involved in a scandal involving ladies. And this report, believe it or not, which I found in an Australian newspaper that uh, published in Melbourne, 
and they talk about the disappearing vicar of Hunslet, and they say that the vicar has been found because from a ship which was on the way to South Africa, he cabled the bishop in Yorkshire, the Bishop of Ripon, to say he wasn't coming back, he was emigrating to Australia, and the stories about him and his female companion were untrue, and that uh, his wife was not to blame, etc., etc. It's, it's a ripping yarn, and uh, pity we don't have more time for it. Well, Yes, if there was no radio to 1924, what did men do in Hunslet? Well, basically, uh, they could join one of the Brotherhoods. Here's an incredible photograph of the Brotherhood, which provided for recreation and spiritual improvement at uh, Salem Chapel in Hunslet, well, just about in Hunslet, under the ministry of uh, Smith and Wrigley. I mean, incredibly, this had 2,000 members at its peak in 1925. Uh, there was a brotherhood at St. Mary's Parish Church in Hunstead that also had a membership of over a 1,000. So these sort of organizations were important for social purposes, recreational purposes as well. And of course, there were the public houses. And here we see work workers, skilled workers, I think, from perhaps from Alf Cook's print works or John Fowler's, which was just on the opposite side of the road in 1905. Where are they going, we wonder? What is the special occasion? Are they about to go on a trip? Rugby was also hugely important in Hunslet. Hunslet's rugby league team were, you know, the stars of the uh, period, really. And here we see Albert Goldthorpe, a local hero, who led the team to win all four rugby league trophies in 1908. And of course, our Albert was the hero of the hour. And when they got back from winning their final trophy, 20,000 people met them at, in Hunslet for the parade. Um, Anderson talks about um, all sorts of things. He mentions, as we see here, Hunslet Feast on the moor, a great occasion in the summer. Uh, lovely picture of this. Um, it was enjoyed by old and young. Well, what I haven't had time to say is that Francis, when he was 15, decided to go down the mines. And basically he led pit ponies. He worked at Robin Hood Colliery about uh, a mile or so about two miles from Hunslet. Um, he subsequently uh, came out of the mines, I think in about 1923, and worked at Hunslet Mill, uh, where he helped make blankets. Thereafter, he left uh, the mill in 1945, and thereafter we lose sight of him. The point about this is that Francis Anderson was clearly, from his writings, an intelligent chap uh, bright, likeable, but like so many working class boys in Hunstead, he left uh, elementary school age 13 and followed the typical route in life for an average Hunstead boy. The great contrast is with Richard Hoggart. Richard Hoggart, uh, born in Chapel, uh, sorry, Potter Newton in 1918, um, Two, year, two decades old, uh, younger than uh, Richard, uh, than Francis Anderson. Basically, he followed a different path. He became a very distinguished academic. Uh, for a period, he was an assistant director of uh, General of UNESCO. And fortunately for us, he wrote two books which tell us about his life in Hunslet. The Uses of Literacy in 1957, which was a hugely seminal and important work about working class culture, in which there are reminiscences which he drew on from his life as a working class lad in uh, Hunslet. And then in 1988, he produced A Local Habitation, written about his uh, life in Hunslet between 1918 and 1940. 
The second one in particular is an absolutely fantastic read. And if you can get a copy, you really uh, should read it. It's both entertaining, uh, affecting, and uh, full of interest. Well, so he was born in Potter Newton in 1918. He was orphaned and came to live with his grandmother at 33 Newport Street in 1925, age seven. Essentially, he was a boy brought up in poverty. From a locational point of view, we see Frank had been living down uh, off Church Street in a yard in contrast, but still very close. And you see all these packed houses, street after street of back to back. Uh, Richard Hoggart uh, came to Newport Street, which ran off Hunslet Road down to Jack Lane. We'll get a close up here. Oh. Oh, yes, Here, here's this view just to emphasize that, we've, which we've just seen, which is Hunslet Road running along there. And in these terraces of working class houses, there was Newport Street. In close up here, we see the environment in which Hoggart was brought up at 33 Newport Street. And we see he was just, um, Newport Street was almost parallel to Joseph Street. There we see Newport Street in the center there, but seeing that on Joseph Street, there was first of all the Roman Catholic Chapel. There was also the public baths. There were two, a clothing factory, a printing works, the primitive Methodist Chapel, the Crown Bottle Works, and then just on the edge, his school. So it was a hive of activity and he was surrounded by industry. Here is a view of Newport Street. He lived, this is the Hunslet Road end. He lived further down, I think on the right hand side, but you see the typical sort of small cottage in which he lived. He lived there with his grandma and three aunties. And he noted this issue about um, where did people work? He noted that his three aunts, he said, like the majority of respectable working class women in Hunslet, they headed for the large clothing factories of Leeds, Burton's perhaps, Summary's Weaver to Wearer. But it is important to realize that of course, although you lived in Hunslet, because of the tram, you no longer needed to live close to where you worked. And you could take the tram to Burton's in uh, north of the city center or other places. So people who lived in Hunslet, even if uh, the industries of Hunslet were struggling, they had the opportunity to go and work elsewhere in the city where things were going better. Richard attended Joseph Street Primitive Methodist Church, and he says in his book that basically this provided a lot of his social life and recreational activity. He went there, worshipped there, attended there well into his teenage years. He went to Round Hay Park for trips. He went to Temple Newsome, those sort of short distance places, but very attractive that you could get there on the trams. Um, he joined the cycling club of Salem Chapel when he was 16, and that allowed him to go around Yorkshire. It was a huge liberation. Hoggett says it was like being given a sports car, to be given a brand new bike, which his auntie gave to him because he passed his. Um, school certificate examinations. Now in a local habitation, he describes in detail the habits, the activities, and the attitudes of the working classes in Hunslet. Um, as I say, it's a wonderful read. But I want to now concentrate in particular, in conclusion really, to talk about his education. As an orphan, he was the responsibility and part of the Leeds Board of Guardians. They paid his grandmother, who was a loving woman, a weekly allowance towards his maintenance. Miss Jubb, the officer on behalf of the 
guardians visited regularly to monitor how he was getting on. But he was clearly a poor working class boy, seemingly with no prospects. At the age of seven, when he moved to Hunslet, he went to uh, Jack Lane Elementary School, which we see here, where he might well have stayed until he was age 14, the school leaving age had gone up, and he would then probably have just gone into a Hunslet factory. He notes that in a sense that the principal role of elementary schools in this period was to provide a basic education in anticipation that pupils would leave at 14 to go and work in the factories or in the coal mines of South Leeds. He notes that the obstacles to the educational progression of working class children in Hunslet before the Second World War was enormous, particularly for poor working class children. Working class families need the income of a child at 14. It was important to supplement the income of the family. He also noticed that meanwhile, there was a lack of aspiration amongst the teachers in the elementary schools because of their assumption that Hunslet children would go into jobs for which a higher level of education was unnecessary. Indeed, the teachers knew that the parents of working class children especially the poor ones, would be unable or unwilling to afford the fees charged by the council secondary schools. In, if a headmaster or headmistress thought a pupil had the ability to go on to secondary education and beyond, the only route was, the only route was by entering or the school entering the pupil for the 11 plus examination, which if they passed would provide them with a scholarship that is a free place to attend Coburn High School. The headmaster at Jack Lane Elementary School knew enough of the circumstances and attitudes of Hunslet families not to put more than two or three of his boys into the exam every year, but he recognized in Richard Hoggart a bright boy. Hoggart noted that to sit for the 11 plus, you had to walk out of Hunslet over the moor to the edge of Dewsbury Road to Coburn High School. This is the one which without question, you would be assigned to if you passed the 11 plus. Indeed, Coburn served the whole, it was a the secondary school for the whole of South Leeds. Richard took the English and maths exams in the 11 plus but was entirely flawed by the maths. It wasn't the sort he'd been taught at Jack Lane Elementary School. He'd probably been taught arithmetic, and this was maths with other aspects. So he failed the 11 plus, as indeed did Keith Waterhouse, the uh, journalist, about 10 years younger than Richard Hoggart. But Hoggart actually got a scholarship to Coburn because Mr. Harrison, who was clearly uh, thought he was very good, his headmaster at Jack Lane School walked down to the Leeds Education Office in Calverley Street, bearing an essay written by Richard Hoggart and made a direct appeal to the Director of Education. The result was that Hoggart was awarded a place at Coburn School. He was the first pupil ever from Jack Lane Elementary School to get into Coburn High School. That is the first pupil in a quarter of a century. He noted that in contrast, the 11 plus examination could be and was easily prepared for by lower middle-class parents from other parts uh, of the city's uh, school's catchment area. They could send their children to junior schools and more particularly they could get in additional tuition at home to help their kids get through the 11 plus. Times haven't changed, have they? But despite all this, half the pupils at Coburn High School were fee paying. Hoggart noted that even in the Coburn sixth form, the curriculum was relatively narrow and encouraged little intellectual inquiry. There wasn't much interest in music, not a lot of interest in the visual arts but he did find a way 
to branch off the track and make his own discoveries, and this was through Hunslet Public Library. The library was opened in Waterloo Road in February 1931, and very grand it was. It initially had 8,000 books. It doesn't sound a lot in one sense, but Hoggart thought at the time there were probably only 50 books in the whole of the cottages and houses in Newport Street. And a lot of these would have been free giveaways with newspapers or magazines. He noted that a great many people from poor backgrounds had paid tribute to the place of free public libraries in their unofficial, edu and in their unofficial education. What he said the public libraries gave was a revelation of the possible size and depth and variety of life knowledge and understanding. Hoggart was just 12 when the library opened, but it came for him a home from home, uh, where there was a small junior library study room which he could use. He said for him on certain evenings, it was a wonderful extension of space, quiet, warm, and with facilities uh, that he only saw at school. He roamed the shelves of the main library like a jackdaw, sucking things in. So Hoggart took the school certificate exams at 16 and did well. But should he leave school at 16, as most of his fellow pupils would do? The headmaster's report said, just in a little note, said that he thought that Richard might be suited to a professional life. Grandma, not sure what this meant, asked Miss Job of the Board of Guardians what it did mean. And she said, well, he could be a clergyman or maybe a doctor. Grandma was impressed and thought he should go on. And happily, Miss Job managed to double the weekly allowance which the Guardians paid in maintenance for Richard. And that was not all that far short of a very, very low wage, so he could still help support the household. He did extremely well at higher school certificate, uh, which he took at 18 years old, and at that point he was to leave Coburn. In reflecting on his experience of Coburn, he absolutely loved the place. He later recalled, when I think of the place, I see first the classrooms of the sixth form with a teacher glad to have a small group of clever children and doing his or her best to introduce them to a wider world. I think second of walking home at about 4.15 or so in the middle of winter when the street lights have already begun to come on. I would look round as I crossed the clinkered moor and still see over the housetops half a mile away, the pale yellow glow of its classrooms and corridors and its cupolas standing up half silver gray in the near darkness. It exercised a powerful appall on my imagination as Oxford's dreaming spires on Matthew Arnold's or Christ's Minster's on Jude the Obscure. Well, he did so well in his high school certificates that he uh, won a scholarship to en enter the English department at Leeds University. He began three wonderful years at the university, starting in October 1936, the month the Brotherton Library opened. And just imagine this from a poor working class boy from Hunslet, the university must have seen an enchanted place. Well, in conclusion, which will only take a couple of minutes, in the 1960s, housing in Hunslet was in a terrible state. Some slum clearance was long overdue. But the council didn't opt for a gradual renewal approach. This shows the plan that it decided on, which was to flatten the whole area in which Richard Hoggart and others had lived. And here you see the plan for Hunslet Grange. We have Church Street running down there, and there in the square is the library with Waterloo Road running past. Here is Hunslet Road. It's 
Joseph Street is still there. It's left in this plan with the church, the Roman Catholic Church and the public baths. And amazingly, in the middle there is left Richard Hoggart's Jack Lane Elementary School, but surrounded by what were to be these awful, awful blocks of flats that were built in the 1960s. Here we see, just to emphasize this as a picture from uh, proudly in, included in the council's brochure, Project Leeds, Britain's motorway city of the 70s. And just to sort of, it's, it's not a good picture. Stephen and I would very much like to find a good a high resolution copy of this. There is Hunslet Parish Church, the bottom right hand corner, Church Street. Up here we have in the yellow triangle, here we have Jack Lane running along there, Waterloo Street running up there, and there is Joseph Street running down from the red at Hunslet Road. And there, just left in the middle there, you can just peek out, or perhaps you can't, Jack Lane Elementary School. And here we see a photograph from the air of the top left-hand corner of that four-phase development. And here we see the awful flats, notorious as they were. And we see, I didn't recognize this at first a few months ago, here is Jack Lane, elementary school with the remains of um, Jack Lane running past it. And yes, the baths are still there. We might just about make up the top right, the uh, Joseph Street Roman Catholic Church. Well, the fact was that these this development was so awful that having been put in the late 1960s, it was demolished in 1985. And in this view, this is a view in uh, 1991, I think. No, yeah. Yeah, 1985, I think, just before that. And we're looking across, across Hunslet Lane. There is the Catholic Church. The baths are still there and just the edge of part of the Leak Street flats. Richard Hoggart thought it a housing disaster. And when he returned to Joseph Street in 1991, and we see looking down the street, there is the Roman Catholic Church, Joseph Street, and there is Richard Hoggart looking across the rubble towards Newport Street where he had lived. He said he was heartened that those awful flats had gone. Was nostalgic for the community life but not the buildings of the area in which he lived in Hunslet. And he hoped, his big hope, that the new houses that were being built in place of the flats would restore a sense of neighborliness and community to this part of Hunslet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that very rich and fascinating talk. There have been a number of questions on the chat line with wonderful prescience. You've already answered some of them when you started talking about uh, Hunslet Grange and Meek Street Flats. But two questions from Jane Collins. First of all, she asked whether people uh, rented their houses in Hunslet or whether they bought them. And then an entirely separate question was who was the architect of the Hunslet Library and how was it funded? Well, uh, taking the question, I mean, this question of renting or buying, the majority of people uh, rented. And it's interesting that actually that, particularly say in the Edwardian period, the interwar period, actually that rent for a house probably only constituted about, well, no more than 20% of family income. You know, the proportion spent on food was more like 45 to 50%, so that, Renting was cheap. The quality of the accommodation wasn't very good, but few people, except for, should we say, the artisan class, the very skilled workers, actually bought their own houses. And of course, um, in the, uh, what I suppose, the 20s, particularly the 30s, uh, some Hunslet residents moved out to the new council estates where they rented, Belle Isle. Uh, Middleton, other parts of the city. But in fact, 
rent in one sense was a relatively small part compared to today of actually family income. Um, the architect of the uh, library, without looking it up, I can't tell you immediately, but the point was that it was financed by the library, so it was part of the provision of new public library. Uh, there were library, of course, there was a library on Dewsbury Road from the early 20th century, but you can see the council were absolutely determined in uh, creating building Hunslet Library that they were going to create a showpiece. And Stephen Burt tells me that I think after it was opened in the 1930s, the number of books borrowed from Hunslet Library was the largest of any library in the whole of the city. So it was a huge and really important resource for the community. Well, thank you. So can I just come here, Kevin, and say thank you so much for your excellent lecture. I'm moving in six weeks and I'm desperate to finish this Hunslet book. So you've done a sterling job in there. Two things, really. If I can appeal, as Kevin did at the start, for anyone with additional information, photographs, personal reminiscences to come forward because constantly more and more information is coming in. The other week, Janine Steele, bless her, of Stevenson's Wallpaper, who has the most extensive family archive, gave some wonderful information that had come from a grandfather regarding the poverty that Kevin's been talking about and how her grandfather used to look across the road from his shop and see children who were barefoot come out during lunchtime and try and beg from the workmen anything that was left over from their, work their, their lunch boxes. And that paints such a wonderful picture of that 20s and 30s where there were still boots for the bands. These people were, many of them couldn't afford shoes for their children. And I think today when we talk about levels of poverty and deprivation, we forget just how desperate those times truly were, particularly those Kevin was talking about with the miners' strike. One of the things which, uh, well, there's two questions been coming up. The first is the architect. It's a man called Thomas Horseman, who was the architect. £1,049 it cost, and with it being League City Council, 17 shillings and sixpence as well was in there. So, you know, they had to be absolutely precise, yet that was the case. And it was opened on the 23rd of February 1931 by Arthur Greenwood, who was the Minister of Health. So, again, you were getting top-notch people coming to Hunslet. But I think the one thing that, you know, Kevin dealt with so well is Hunslet is so important and the amount of material there is vast. Linda Kitchen asked about population. In 1901, the population was 69,064. That was two and a half times the size of Wakefield. And again, I think that stat really rams home just how many people were crowded cheek by jowl into that area. And despite the fact it had been an area of huge in-migration, there was a, a vast amount of community cohesion. You know, people, there had been the traditional Hunslet families, like the Bauer family who'd been there for decades, and the Armitages. But they were joined, from, particularly from the 1850s onwards, by people coming from uh, everywhere, from Ireland, Scotland, Lincolnshire, Cornwall, all coming there. And yet they became a really cohesive group. And I think the rugby team in particular, which Kevin alluded to there, really made that community gel. And they became almost the characters of Hunslet with their own particular dialect. And with the census coming up, I'll pick this bit, I'll just be brief. But this, <laughs> this really, really amused me did this. Because in 1901, the census man called at this lady in Hunslet. And he said in his posh voice, good morning, ma'am. I am an enumerator. I brought you a census paper, which I want you to have filled in by Monday morning when I will call for it. He responded, I shan't fill in note for you. That's straight. 
He said, yes, my dear, but this paper is issued by the government. I don't care who's giving you it. I'm not filling it in. I'm not putting your blue paper in my house. So that's it. The enumerator then went on to say, if you do not fill in this paper, you will be summoned before the justices and you will be fined five pounds. Well, that's fine. I don't care. Let them find me because I've no to pay with. And I just think that that, and then another one which really amused me was during World War One, when uh, all the factories are working uh, flat out, the munition workers aren't being pro properly nourished. And the government's very concerned that people are literally falling by the wayside because of this. And so they try to introduce a government scheme for uh, canteens. And one of these is supposed to be being built on Hunslet Road. And this really got up the nose of William Franklin, who owned the cafe there. And he claimed canteens may well be needed in the south of England, where useless housewives do no baking and little cooking. But in a working class neighborhood like Hunslet, oh, almost every housewife knows how to cook a good meal. <laughs> I, just think, I just think that is absolutely rip-roaring because it says it, it absolutely says it all. It really does. It's just such fun. And that's what's funny in Huntsley with, with Kevin and with Jeff Driver has been great fun. And, you know, the archive is simply, simply wonderful. And thank you, Kevin, for what was a truly inspirational lecture. Thank you, Stephen, for those interesting comments. There have been lots of interesting comments on the chat line, which I haven't got time to read, but I will download them all and Kevin will see them. We have about five, ten minutes left. If anyone wants to make a comment or ask a question, please just unmute yourself and say what you want to say. And just to say, Alan, there was a question about the slum clearance in Huntsford. Yes, I thought you'd answered that question, actually, but... Well, 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 I think I think just just one one thing to say was that basically that properties in Hunslet were uh, listed for slum clearance, but when it came to the point, basically Holbeck was the priority, and so there was very very little slum clearance in Hunslet, you know, before well, I imagine probably the 1960s. And so the thing was that the property in Hunslet got into a terrible state, particularly because landlords knew that their property was going to be demolished. So they didn't, didn't bother to, uh, to maintain it. So the council had this attitude, well, we need to have a, a clean sweep here, which was why the proposals was mass, almost system built housing, but um, on a huge scale. Thank you. Does anybody like to make a comment or ask a question? Just unmute yourself and speak. Hi there. My yes. name is Dave Emmett. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my my family were born and brought up in Hunslet, going back for many many years. You know, pre pre nineteen hundred. But during the time that we're talking about, my dad was the uh, um, butcher, the co-op butcher on, uh, in, in Hunslet for, for all those years. Um, and I have many memories of him going down to the shop. I am now, oh, what am I now? 79. Oh. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it means a lot to me to be able to have these these memories of him, he had a, a, a wonderful partner, uh, assistant in the shop, with Bramham, who, you know, was, uh, well, he was a, a wonderful man, a sailor, a marine in the Second World War, uh, a, a magnificent swimmer who used to take me to Joseph, Joseph Street Baths, and he would swim with me on his shoulder, up and on his shoulders, up and down the, the pool there. But uh, my, my, all my family went to Hunslet National School or, or, uh, and Isabel Emmett, he, his wife, uh, Isabel Longfellow, she, as she was at then, uh, uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it, maiden name, 
Um, she was district midwife in, in the area for many, many years, along with uh, another nurse called Joy Draper. Uh, but I, I can rabbit on and on and on, of course, about the, the, this situation. But the, finally, just across the way from here, from, from the shops, the, the quok shops, the grocery, at the back was the blacksmith, who used to, from time to time, make those slabs of toffee, which she used to crack open with a hammer and, and give to the kids. And over the way from the co-op was a, a news agent called Jimmy Longbottom, where everybody went for their, you know, newspaper and cigs and so on and so forth. OK, that's all. <laughs> well, well, can, can I say Stephen may wait, want to comment further, but I mean, that's a fantastic reminiscence. And if, Dave, you could email Alan, I think you'll have his email address. Yes. Because because we would like to have a chat with you, most certainly. I think we do actually have a photograph of the co-op shop, okay. uh, butcher's shop, which is interesting. But, you know, you're exactly the sort of person we'd like to talk to. And also your memories of Hunslet Nash. Did you call it Hunslet Nash in your day? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I went to Cross Strat School. I was born in Beeston, you know, just over the way from... from yes. Um, but uh, yeah, my dad was uh, a mum, but both. Uh, they both went. Yeah, Hunslet, well, yeah. Dad, dad actually went to St Luke's in Beeston, but mum was a, a Hunslet girl, along with, uh, uh, well, she was the eldest of four. Uh, her younger brother, Eddie, were, worked in the post office for, for all, all his working life. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it's yeah, well, it's, in, it's interesting, Kevin, because just scanning the chats at the moment, there are quite a lot of people there. There's Marcia Firth, there's Graham Whitley, there's Stuart Petch, there's yeah. Glynis Rushby, there's Peter Spofforth, and there's also Pat, someone called Pat. All of those, it would be really interesting, <laughs> actually, to have follow-up contact with. I think you're, you're, you're splendid, the work that you do, and I am so grateful. I've had tears in my eyes listening to you. Thank you, Dave, for those comments. I will pass on, if I may, to Kevin and Stephen, the email addresses of people who've made comments so that they can contact you. I hope that will be all right. I, I will. Good. OK. I think this is a good point at which to end this evening's session. I'd just like to thank Kevin enormously on behalf, your behalf for the most interesting and fascinating mm. talk.